Hello and welcome to another episode on uh, why technology fails. Today I'm going to do a little bit of an experiment <clears throat> and see how a uh, presentation plays uh, in this context. Um, and I'm going to go through a short presentation I did to a group of faculty and administrators at a, a local community college where I also teach. Um, but it's got broad applicability because it does incorporate lots of elements of the idea spaces framework, both in terms of pointing out where the current system's shortcomings lie, but also in terms of providing roadmaps to concrete solutions that uh, can also be applied quite broadly uh, beyond education. Uh, as I point out many times, and I've said many times in the past, Innovation is nothing but in a, but a, uh, but learning at scale, uh, and uh, when we're talking about modern higher education, we're having to scale a lot of learning anyway. So innovation is baked into that. But even in a company uh, where innovation is a priority, uh, these same sort of principles apply. These principles of transparency and connectedness that uh, are essential to giving meaning to students, also give meaning and drive to employees. So I incorporate you know, a lot of concepts from my work with uh, Shaping EDU, as well as the two books that I've written and quite a few articles over time. Uh, and so I, I will touch on those and, and talk about how all these things build out of the idea spaces framework. We learned a lot of lessons over the last couple of years in higher education, or hopefully we learned a lot of lessons. Um, remote teaching uh, and digitizing education, which is what effectively we did during remote teaching, uh, really showed both opportunities, and there were quite a few interesting innovations that came out of this, but also revealed the cracks in education as it works today. Um, Students quickly checked out, they lost connection, and that is a natural product of something that's been a problem long before the pandemic, this idea that the system treats the students as widgets, that the primary motivations for doing anything in the system is the accumulation of grades and certification. And when you divorce the human element or, or maybe not divorce, but separate and uh, distance the human element uh, from that, it really became very obvious that students, that uh, a lot of what we were doing in the classroom uh, was pointless. And um, it was disconnected, meaningless learning, as I say here. Uh, and it was challenging for everyone, even those of us that were doing a lot of flexible adjustments to the situation to keep those students engaged, to, to uh, get them through the semester and make them successful. And that's because we have an analog education system designed under the industrial processes models that have existed for the last 100 years plus. Uh, and they're increasingly out of sync with the realities of uh, the real world as it exists today, which is increasingly digital. In an analog world, you rely on experts. You rely on scarcity of information and knowledge. These are things that the university uh, excels at. But in a digital world, that all gets broken down. There is no funnel anymore for information. We don't have a Walter Cronkite anymore telling us what's important what's not. This isn't necessarily a bad thing because if Walter Cronkite decided something wasn't important, no one talked about it. Uh, and that this was a, uh, you know, a lot of voices were not heard. But the flip side of that is now it's on the individual to decide what's uh, most important to them, which streams of information and knowledge to follow, um, how to construct their own meanings and world. Um, and that requires a whole new set of skills that simply were not as important 30, 40, 50 years ago. Uh, when, you know, uh, when I was in school or many people of my generation were in school. I wasn't in school that long ago. But um, the other thing, the other key factor here is that uh, there's a lot more visual information. We're not tied to text in the same way as we used to. 
And while that doesn't mean we get rid of text, it all, it does mean that we need to leverage these new new possibilities to look at problems in different ways. And so visual thinking and visual learning is critical in a digitally augmented world. So if all you're teaching in your class is text and linear thinking, it's going to seem very out of sync with the realities that most of the students are facing. But at the same time, the other side is very scary and um, uh, automatically raises the question, well, if we've blown everything up, how do we make sense of it all? Well, we need to develop new sets of frameworks. Now, my idea spaces framework is one attempt at that. Uh, it basically breaks down everything into three different elements that have to be considered for anything, whether we're talking about uh, physical environments, whether we're talking about bureaucratic environments, we're talking about virtual environments. They all have these three elements in common. They deal with space, uh, and space is quite often defined by the tools which we use uh, to, to work with it. Um, and uh, digital tools give us a lot more freedom. You know, we're not required to everybody go sit in the same room together and listen in the same way. We can communicate in a whole range of ways with different tools, for instance, just to, to cite the, problem, the question of communication. Um, but the nature of our tools defines the environment that we work in. If we are clever about our choice of tools, if we are strategic about them, uh, we can actually manipulate time in ways that were impossible in an analog environment. It's not necessary to get together in the same class uh, physical space all the time. There may be times when that's appropriate, but there's a lot of things you can do uh, outside of that environment that um, give you a lot more flexibility in time. Maybe it's time where people don't have to travel, but maybe it's also time where uh, individuals can uh, work on their own time, you know, at their own pace. So that's, that's, you know, that's an example of how time comes into play in, in this thing. And then finally, we have structures. Now, we have existing structures. We're constantly building structures. School is a structure. Uh, courses are structures. Uh, any bureaucratic environment is a structure. The company uh, uh, hierarchies are structures. These are all human institutions that we've built up in order to provide order for the world. Um, digital challenges analog structures, for sure. But it also offers the opportunity to create entirely new structures or to modify existing structures and uh, to try new things out. So let me talk about um, how three different projects that I've been working on are impacted by this, this framework. Um, first of all, space. Now, a number of years ago, I was asked to design a campus or help design a campus where there really wasn't enough classroom space to achieve the uh, projected need for enrollment. And the idea that the uh, brainstorming group came up with was, well, let's build a, a hybrid campus. And I set myself to trying to figure out what exactly would that look like. And that made me think about uh, space in a very different way. Instead of planning out your uh, sp your campus in terms of things like classroom space first and foremost, which most campus design is built around that. Uh, instead of doing that, perhaps you should build it out uh, around productive spaces. And some of that's classroom space, but a lot of it could be informal classroom space uh, or informal spaces where students can come together, work together among themselves, or maybe with small groups with a, with a professor or a tutor or other kinds of specialists helping them out. And so you would design a central area where everybody could come together and basically congregate and let the students design that space, let the employees design that space the way they need it to work. Um, and so this formed the basis for a campus that's set to open in a few months, actually. I hope they uh, got the final construction part right. The uh, other side of this, though, is that you could do the exact same thing uh, in a virtual environment. You create a virtual space where people can come together, where, where services are accessible 
and then you make that adjacent to the instructional spaces. And you could even congregate multiple classes around a single commons area online in a space if you had the right software platform or combination of software platforms. And I call this a stack model. Uh, and uh, I, I wrote up an article on this for current issues in education. If you want to go uh, search it out, the link is there on the slide. Um, the And I'll put it in the description. Uh, the four elements of this are stickiness, tool sets, adjacencies, and community. So the space has to be sticky and the students have to want to stay there. They have to be provided with tools for collaboration and, and, and working. Um, they need to be adjacent to help, whatever that might be. That's the light blue uh, ovals in this. And they can be connected to a larger community, whether we're talking about a local community or uh, a virtual community, an academic community that stretches across the globe. Um, and putting all those things together and making them accessible and easily uh, graspable by the students will make this a very productive space uh, for them. Now, in order to be able to rethink time, you need to uh, actually uh, spend some time thinking about what exactly you're doing with that time and what you want to do with that time. If you use the model here, which is from Diana Laurel Arts, uh, teaching as a design science, the, the, the six uh, red boxes are different uh, teaching practices. It's practicing things, acquisition, in other words, learning, uh, picking up knowledge, discussing things, searching for knowledge, which is inquiry, collaboration, working with other students, and then actually producing uh, things. And to this, I actually added a, a seventh one, which is curiosity. Um, and if you go through those and look at uh, different ways in which you can use tools to bend time, that's what this middle framework is here, then uh, you can come up with different combinations of uh, environments that allow you to manipulate uh, the effective quality time that students have to work on projects. So the five areas here are traditional, which means in person, in a room together, what you would typically think of in a classroom, informal, uh, where you're not necessarily there at the same time, uh, the teacher's not necessarily there at the same time with the students, but the students are there working together. Um, those are both proximate. They're in person, in the same place physically. The blue areas are the same thing in a distant environment. So conversational is like a Zoom meeting or something like that. It's the same time, but people can be geographically quite distant from one another. And then the other blue box is what I call presentational, which is uh, people can work at their own pace, at their own time where they're working. Uh, and, um, you know, they then bring work back to one of the other spaces. The final box in the middle there is what I call combinatorial. And I don't want to spend a lot of time talking about this because it's kind of speculative at this point, but uh, extended reality um, could break down some of the barriers and uh, make this whole f uh, chart a whole lot more fluid than it already is. Um, but this is an example of how you can adapt time around the needs of the individual um, and using using through strategic use of tools. And then the last one is, okay, imagine a structure where uh, the class forms a hub of uh, knowledge and information that, uh, and, and, and um, special, uh, specialist help that uh, maximizes the ability of the students to learn. There are a lot of logistical barriers to pulling this off in a physical environment, but if you combine a physical environment or have an exclusively online environment, combine a physical environment with, a, with an online environment, you can bring people in a lot more easily uh, in different ways, both synchronously and asynchronously. Uh, so you could imagine having a classroom where, uh, as, a, as a social science course, a government course like my course, you'd have a statistics faculty member who is, uh, trains the students on a specific way of doing statistics that could then be applied in an actual analysis within the social science class itself, a design faculty that helps students design policies and strategies for getting things done, uh, an English faculty member that helps the students with the nuts and bolts of writing uh, and, uh, and expression. Uh, 
uh, you know, on a wide range of things so that they can communicate those ideas. You can have outside experts come in. You could have a, a congressman or a specialist from out, well, well outside your local region come in a Zoom session and simply uh, uh, and, and interact with the students and be able to bring a richness to the experience. There's also service folks. You could have counseling involved. Uh, you can have tutoring. You can have makerspace or design help uh, from that side. Now, the one area of this that I've actually done is I have an embedded librarian in my class, and she has her own page, and she creates her own content, and she interacts with the students independent of my my work with them. Uh, and this is in a fully online class. Um, and uh, she also comes in and does guest lectures and stuff like that. So this actually works, and it's pretty easy to do as long as you have access to the resources. But this is where this could all develop toward to create a system of learning instead of just having one-off courses that operate in isolation. There's no reason for that anymore. So the, you know, thinking about how specifically the social sciences and, and how you create digital citizens interacts, you know, why this is all important. Well, first of all, uh, it's really important no matter what you're teaching uh, to uh, give the students uh, a sense of meaning and and around learning, because otherwise the idea of them being a lifelong learner kind of flies out the window. If you want them to uh, uh, to love learning and to continue learning long after college, then you have to give them a reason to do so and why it's why it should mean something to them. I mean, they're going to continue learning whatever, but. Do they have the skills to do it uh, uh, as a as a good critical thinker? Um, social sciences, abstract information literacy, and 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 they have a direct impact on the needs of society. You know, we teach Democrats in our classes, and I mean little D Democrats. This is not a political thing, but in the sense of education is shown to be a major influence on how uh, interactive people are with their societies and how empowered they feel. Um, and that lights the last one is that, you know, with digital technology, we can bring in diverse voices, voices, which you literally that are, were very difficult to pull off before. And if we're really serious about diversity, equity, and inclusion, those voices need to be heard in our classes. And that, so that we start to understand how, uh, incredibly, uh, complex and diverse our societies are and how those, how to work together with people who may come from a different experience than you do in terms, but may have similar needs, you know, in terms of what they want out of, what they want out of society. It doesn't matter what the color of your skin is, what your sexual orientation is, uh, what your gender is. You still need health care, for instance, just to cite one example. So that's where we left it. Uh, there's my uh, contact information and uh, the books. And obviously, uh, feel free to uh, reach out if you're uh, interested in this topic and or want me to make additional videos like this one. Thank you.